All right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar on applying prevention through design to solar systems in small buildings. My name is Jessica Bunting, and I'm the CPWR host and tech support for the event. If you're experiencing technical difficulties at any time, you can contact me either by responding to the uh, reminder email you got about an hour ago or by contacting me in your chat box. Um, or you can even give me a call, 301-495-8515. Um, if you're having trouble just hearing through your computer speakers, we recommend calling in using your phone instead. And that call-in information can be found, again, in the WebEx emails you've received, including the reminder an hour ago, um, or by clicking the event info tab at the top left of your screen. We'll take some time at the end of today's presentation to answer questions, but you can enter them at any time in the Q&A or chat boxes. Uh, please do keep in mind um, that if you're going to type in a question, it is best to either address it to everyone or to me, the host, and not privately to the presenters. Um, that way we can make sure we see all of the questions. Okay, and finally, uh, today's webinar will be recorded. Um, so if you're interested in reviewing it or sharing the information with colleagues, I will make the recording and a PDF of the slides available after the event. Our presenters today led the research team that worked on this study and generated the report we'll be talking about. It's my pleasure to introduce Chris Lee, Assistant Professor in the Department of Construction Management at the University of Washington, and John Gambatis, Professor in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering at Oregon State University. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Chris. Well, thank you, Jessica. Uh, hello, everybody. Again, my name is Chris Lee, and uh, today we are going to talk about the research project that we recently completed about a few months ago. And this title is Applying Prevention Through Design, simply PTD, to solar system in small, building, uh, small buildings. And this project was done in about one year from July 2016, uh, I'm sorry, August 2016 to July this year. And as the main outcome of this research, uh, we were able to identify and develop uh, seven PTD attributes and a safety protocol and uh, the goal of this presentation is to uh, explain those uh, research findings and then discuss their implications. Okay, here is the overall outline of the presentation. First of all, as an introduction, we are going to briefly talk about why we care about uh, uh, worker safety associated with solar system in small buildings, and then we are going to discuss why and how the use of prevention through design, PTD, can help improve the overall performance, safety performance of solar contractors in the residential sector. And then we are going to discuss how we collected and analyzed uh, data in order to develop uh, the seven PTD attributes and the PTD safety protocol. Uh, and then I'm gonna, we are going to go over the solar safety PTD protocol uh, uh, in a greater detail as the main uh, part of this presentation. And lastly, this presentation will end with a uh, discussion about the seminar that we hosted to gain industry feedback on the protocol. As a jump start, uh, here are the two main research objectives that we had in our mind when embarking on this journey. And uh, first uh, objective was to investigate how to proactively address uh, worker safety concern from uh, design process for solar installation on small buildings. And our specific focus was on small business uh, solar contractors because we believe that many of them don't have uh, strong safety practices in place. And based on the investigation, the second objective was to develop a relevant knowledge and resources that can support the effective application of PTD to solar design and installation. Okay, so why do we care about uh, solar safety? As many of you know, the U.S. industry has seen a really dramatic increase uh, in the number of solar panels installed in the last 10 years. And uh, this chart in the slide shows that trend very well. Such an exponential increase has been driven by mainly three sectors, uh, residential, 
a commercial and utility. And out of those three sectors, click twice, I'm sorry. Okay, out of those three sectors, we spec specifically focused on residential sector because we believe that the workers in the residential sector are exposed to unique type of safety uh, risk and hazard. It's largely because they mostly have to work on the small buildings and mostly in a slope roof in outdoor conditions, as you can see from the picture of this slide. And that motivate us to pursue this research. And there are a couple of other safety factors, uh, facts that we consider for this, uh, for this risk study. First, uh, falls have been a significant concern for everybody in the construction industry, which can be a significant concern for everybody in the solar industry. Uh, and second, previous studies showed that almost 50% of the construction fatality and accident are somehow linked to design decisions that can be effectively identified, managed, and reduced by the application of PTD. Uh, that said, uh, in the next section, uh, John will uh, give you an introduction to the PTD concept. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is John Gambatis at Oregon State University, and, and also thank you, Jessica, for the nice introduction. Uh, I participated in the study along with Chris. We worked on it together. And uh, I wanted to mention also that uh, the funding for the study came from CPWR, and we appreciate the opportunity to, to look into the topic. We know it's something of interest to the industry, and so uh, I thank, thank CPWR for, for that. Um, what I'm going to do for a little bit here is to uh, introduce uh, a topic of prevention through design, and perhaps some of you already are aware of the topic and know much about it. Um, and I, I have um, done some research on the topic and wanted to share some of the things that I have learned as it is the, the foundation for what we are uh, looking at here, as Chris mentioned, and focusing it on solar panel installations on residential uh, projects. So first of all, I wanted to just provide a, a very basic definition of prevention through design, and this comes from NIOSH that has its own prevention through design program. And you can see there that it, it focuses on um, designing out hazards and anticipating those hazards and then designing them out for workers uh, in all types of facilities, uh, also related to work methods, operations, processes, equipment, tools, products, and so forth. Um, for us, we are obviously focusing on solar installations. Uh, it can be the design of the uh, panels themselves. It can be design of the uh, facility, the, the roof, the, the building. It can be the design of the layout of the panels. Anything that we design um, that will affect the safety of our workers who are installing the panels. I like to use the term safety constructability. So it's uh, constructability. How can we make construction easier, safer, faster, and so forth? And then focusing that assessment on the safety a part of our, our uh, work operations. And sometimes you'll see, as you can see there, prevention through design is, is, has different acronym, acronyms. One of them is SID safety in design. And sometimes you see design for safety, DFS, and even engineering for safety. So those are all used synonymously uh, as part of application of uh, the concept throughout the industry. Um, if you're interested in more information about the topic in general, there's a link there. NIOSH has a wonderful website that provides uh, information, resources, and so forth. And in the end, if you have any other questions, by all means, you can contact me as well. Looking a little deeper into the topic, one of the things that we, we want to make clear of is, you know, what, what is PTD and perhaps also what it is not. Sometimes we talk about safety and we often solely focus on the worker at the work face and the, the company that is performing the work. However, prevention through design is more of a concept that says anybody involved in the project that is involved in the design of the, the building, the bridge, the road, the panels, whatever it might be, um, can play a role and they have an impact on safety as well. It's perhaps not a traditional 
uh, role that they may play, but it is something that they can help and affect safety positively. So, so what is prevention through design? A uh, few things here that come from a, a website that uh, has been developed on the topic. It says that prevention through design is explicitly considering the safety of construction workers in the design of a project. Note here that we're focusing on construction. Obviously, prevention through design can address any type of industry out there, whether it's construction or manufacturing or um, maybe transportation. Here we're focusing on construction, and we're also focusing on the design of the facility itself. There's a little bit of focus on the, the tools, the design of the tools, but mainly for our study, we focused on the design of the, the residence, the roof, the, the slope of the roof, and so forth, as you'll see later on. So it's making decisions based in part on how the project's inherent risk to construction workers may be affected. And it is related to the designer's role. It's something that the designer of the, the panels or the layout of the panels, or even the designer of the roof itself, if we have a new structure, we're designing a new building, how can we design that roof to accommodate solar panel installation? And so it's, it's something that they can play a role in. What is not prevention through design as we envision it? Um, we want to make sure that we don't mix the, the responsibilities and the liabilities up. And so we uh, envision it as designers um, not taking an active role in safety during construction. So where I am a designer, I will design the layout of the panels, figure out where they should go, or I design the roof system. Uh, that's part of their traditional role, but it's not a, uh, somebody out there taking an a, uh, active role during construction. And it's also not an endorsement for legislation mandating that they do so. That's an important thing because liability comes up a great extent. Um, but they should be, be involved and can or should be held responsible to only what they are contracted to do. So it's not uh, the designers being held responsible for accidents. So with that, um, you might ask, well, why, why should we do this? Uh, we have many successful projects these days where we install solar panels and people do not get injured. Uh, so why are we making this effort? And there's been some research uh, in the past, recent past, that uh, tries to link the design or the planning of a project to the incidents that occur on that project. And you can see some of the results of the studies right here, uh, ranging from maybe 22% all the way up to maybe 63% of those incidents that did occur on a project could have been addressed or prevented through something that, some action or decision that was made upstream of the construction process. Uh, it's both um, very significant and also something that maybe people don't know that um, there is some impact of planning and design on the actual hazards that exist on the site. If you are in the construction world and you've been uh, out on sites where you are building something, perhaps you can imagine those instances where you wonder, why didn't the designer design it a little bit differently? It would really help me, and it would make things safer on this project. So it's trying to answer that question. Um, in addition to that, we want to focus a little bit on uh, this topic of the hierarchy of controls, and perhaps you have seen this before, and if you're in the safety world, you have. Uh, just describing it real briefly here. So we have hazards that exist on our projects, and there are multiple ways to control those hazards to mitigate the risk. We can use personal protective equipment, maybe, or training, administrative controls, some type of engineering control, or even eliminate the hazard altogether. Importantly, we have a choice. We have a choice to, to select one or more and perhaps we may use multiple controls. Uh, there is a recognized difference between the controls in terms of their reliability, where a control 
on the higher level of the hierarchy of controls is much more reliable. If I eliminate the hazard, then that eliminates the risk altogether, as opposed to perhaps using some personal protective equipment that the hazard is still present. And so we'd like to push up the hierarchy of controls, and that actually is consistent with the concept of prevention through design. You can see there, uh, when we're looking at the, the building, for example, in the picture there specifically, we're trying to eliminate the hazards from that or, or substitute something in that's less hazardous. Engineering controls are, are also a, a type of prevention through design, although we don't show them uh, included in here because our study is focused mostly on the, the building itself rather than the, the uh, design of the engineering controls. So one of the hard things here is traditionally when we design something and we develop the drawings, we manufacture the products, uh, we often tend to say, oh, well, just take care of that hazard during the installation or during the construction. And that tends to push us down to the administrative controls and the personal protective equipment. We'd like to, though, try to push up and try to eliminate it during the planning and design. So let's keep that in mind as we go on here. In addition to that, we might ask, well, what's the benefit of doing this? And there are many recognized benefits that people have realized. Uh, obviously, fewer worker injuries and fatalities are something that we see as a benefit. Uh, that comes from reduced risk. We eliminate the hazard, we lessen the risk, and therefore we have fewer injuries and fatalities. In addition to that, we have seen uh, increases in productivity, increases in quality, fewer delays. Those are all things that we want to see on our projects. And importantly, one thing that I've realized over the research that I've done on the topic is the issue there of designer and constructor collaboration, where people talk to each other more and they, the designer thinks about how to help the constructor out. There's a lot more professionalism that goes on in terms of how do we communicate, how do we work together and collaborate for the safety during construction and also perhaps during future maintenance and operations. As you can see there, <clears throat> we also see improved operations and maintenance safety. Reduced workers' compensation premiums are something that we target as well as a benefit of PTD. And you can see also perhaps on the, the little advertisement there, marketing and recognition. If your company provides this service, you can use it as something that will perhaps help market your company. How do we do this? So there have been some uh, example practices <clears throat> on how to implement prevention through design, and this is one example. And it's uh, the process of starting off with the design, the planning and the design, and then going through developing the design and going through a number of review, reviews. In the beginning of the design where you, where you kick it off, um, perhaps uh, one activity would be to establish <clears throat> design for safety expectations. And that can be done through uh, a contract. It can be done through just meeting together and describing what the safety expectations are on the job and who is going to be involved. So it's communicating what that culture is to your uh, stakeholders, to your participants on the project. I didn't include construction and operation perspectives. It's very important there because often the uh, designers may not know what the construction implications are and also what the operations will be. There are certain tools too that can be developed or are uh, secured at that point in time to, to assist with the process. When you go into the design, uh, it's important, if possible, to incorporate some trade contractor involvement. Those are the folks who actually do the work. They have a lot of knowledge who can assist with identifying hazards, figuring out how to change the design to improve the safety. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then after that, continued review through some cross-discipline reviews, maybe a focus safety review, owner review. Uh, and then 
the big yellow arrow there, redesign uh, to incorporate the modifications and then eventually issue for construction. That's a process that's envisioned to assist with incorporating prevention through design. There are many organizations and companies that have done something differently, but this is a, a fairly standard process. So with that, that gives you a little bit of a start on prevention through design. I'd like to now hand it back over to Chris, who's going to talk in detail about the research methods and the results of our study. Well, thank you, John. So with that in mind, uh, this research project was done by uh, implementing two different research methodologies, one interview and a second case study. So at the start of this research, uh, we performed a lot of interviews with the industry practitioners with the goal of uh, investigating their current safety practices and identifying a number of different attributes that may have a significant safety implications. And based on the interview result, we were able to identify uh, seven different PTD attributes. And with those attributes, then we performed uh, uh, four case studies to further validate and analyze the attributes based on uh, real-life uh, case study project in Washington State. And based on the results of case study and interview altogether, we were able to uh, develop a PTD safety protocol that's supposed to serve as a guideline, safety guideline, to support uh, the application of PTD to solar design and installation. Okay, so at first, as I mentioned, we performed a lot of interviews, and this table summarized the interview uh, uh, information. So most interviews were done face-to-face uh, -face for about one hour. Uh, except for a couple of uh, in, uh, cases where we had to do email or phone interview uh, due to their limited availability. And as you can see from the table, we are really trying to talk to various different type of positions, uh, ranging from uh, project engineer, sales associate, uh, company CEO, site manager, electrician, and project manager. Uh, the reason was we actually wanted to capture every story and every aspect of a solar industry in terms of safety. And at, at the end, we are able to complete 13 interviews with 16 solar industry experts. So based on the interview result, we identify a number of different uh, attributes that may have a significant safety implications. And to further narrow down the list, we reach out to 13 uh, solar installation workers to gain their opinions. And basically, we ask them to rate the impact of each attribute to their own safety based on their own experience. And the rating uh, is supposed to be based on one to five scale, with one being low impact and five being high impact. And this slide shows you the uh, summary of the result from the 13 workers' opinions. Um, as you can easily see, the uh, roof slope PTD attribute got the uh, highest rating at 4.7 and followed by roof material, roof protection system, lifting method, and panel layout, and so on and so forth. So based on this rating and based on our interview result, we identify seven PTD attributes that we want to be focused on for this research, and they are listed in this slide. Roof material, roof slope, roof accessory, panel layout, roof protection system, lifting method, and electrical system, and just so you know, the first three attributes are mostly related to existing roof conditions, while the four remaining attributes are mostly about uh, solar system design or contractors and contractors' means and methods. Okay, based on those four, uh, those seven PTD attributes, we then perform four case studies, and the first two case studies uh, were executed by uh, the same contractor on two houses side by side in the city of Tacoma in Washington State, and the, the other two uh, case study were done by uh, two other contractors in a different part of the uh, state. And we basically tried to uh, look at various different types of houses. You know, some house has a uh, uh, steep roof while some don't, and some house has uh, a skylight and some don't. So 
in terms of characteristic, each house has their own uniqueness. So by looking at those various different types of houses and by working with the multiple different solar contractors, the goal of the case study is to uh, capture the current safety practice of those uh, solar contractors they work with and further validate and uh, develop the PTD attribute uh, for the development of uh, PTD uh, protocol. So as a result of the case study, interview, and the survey that we did, uh, we are able to develop 17 page long uh, PTD protocol. And uh, what, is, what you are seeing in this slide is the front page of the protocol. I believe you can download the protocol and our final research report uh, from the CPWR, uh, CPWR website uh, if you're interested in getting more information. And for the next 10 slides, I'm going to go over the contents of this protocol in a greater detail. And once again, the discussion will be largely based on the seven PTD attributes that we identified from roofing material all the way to electrical system. First, up, first part of the protocol is introduction where it talks about the scope of application and a brief introduction to PTD concept. Uh, as I mentioned a few times already, uh, the protocol is supposed to serve as a safety guideline to support effective and efficient application of PTD to design, uh, designing and installing solar panels on small buildings. And next, the proto uh, protocol presents some basic steps that users, users can follow to apply PTD concept to their current safety practices. And by using the uh, generic process that uh, John presented earlier, uh, the first few steps are actually about reviewing uh, existing of conditions and the target solar system design. And then when the initial document is, is created and it should be reviewed for, uh, for the safety concerns and issues, and as the final design document is shaping up, it will be back-checked. It should be back-checked by on-site safety personnel who will then develop a safety implementation plan and enforce safety rules. So those are the steps that we suggest to follow for the effective application of PTD to solar industry. Okay, uh, for the next seven slides, I'm gonna go over the seven attributes one by one. So basically one, uh, one slide for each attribute. Um, the first attribute is roofing material. Um, as, you, as, as you know, there are so many different types of roofing material that are designed and used in US, US residential sector. So it is important to understand the implication of each material to worker safety during solar installation. Uh, for example, what is shown in this slide is a composite shingle roof, which is one of the most popular material that you have to deal with solar insulation in, in this country. And actually it is preferred because it's not as slippery as other roofs, such as metal roof. And also for the installation of safety anchors, it can, it can allow the workers to install safety anchors as many as they want in any suitable location due to the uniqueness of the, unique nature of the roofing material. And the protocol mentions that for roofing material, uh, there, are, there can be a full design consideration to be given. Uh, first things first, roof structure should be carefully examined to make sure it is strong enough to support uh, the weight of desired solar panels. And in terms of safety anchors, we recommend that it should be installed along the reach line of the roof uh, for in improved uh, uh, movability and safety. And also depending on uh, different types of roofing material, you may have to modify installation method. For example, when you're working on wood roof, we recommend you to have a pre-drill as a pilot hole because when it comes to wood roof, it's a little bit tricky to determine whether uh, the solar system is securely attached to main uh, roofing system. So by doing the pre-drill, it will help you determine whether it's securely attached or not. And lastly, uh, different roofing material can require different type of PPE. Uh, for example, when you're working on wood roof or a composite single roof that are losing granularly 
because he's old. And uh, walkers uh, should have uh, special, uh, specially designed walking boots for such condition. Also, when it comes to uh, metal roof on a sunny days, and we suggest that walkers should have uh, sunglasses with a sufficient hydration to prevent any exhaustion. The next attribute is roof slope. And as you can easily understand, roof slope has a very significant safety implication, especially when you're walking on the steep roof. And according to OSHA, uh, any slope that is greater than uh, 4 in 12 is deemed steep. So if you are walking on steep roof or non-steep roof, and OSHA recommends different types of uh, uh, safety provisions, uh, ranging from guardrail, safety net system, or professional forest system, and it is all well spread out in the protocol. And uh, nevertheless, we, based on our interviews and uh, case study, we like to recommend that the use of uh, personal forest system should be always considered when you're working on slope roof, whether it is uh, steep or not steep. Okay, when you're working on a steep roof, also you should uh, provide multiple safety anchors uh, for each worker for improved safety. And lastly, uh, installation sequence can be also impacted by steep roof. And based on our interviews and case study, we low learn from uh, solar contractors that the installation of bottom rack should be done first so that the direction of installation move, can move upward instead of moving downward while using the bottom rack as a support point. So that is an interesting uh, feedback we got from the industry uh, during our investigation. Our next attribute is uh, roof accessories. Uh, in the context of this research, roof accessory refers to uh, various different types of roof structures and items that you may have to deal with for your solar insulation, such as domers, uh, skylight, a roof vent, or a chimney. Um, and then we, uh, we think that the uh, roof accessories can increase the risk of tripping and falling, so it has significant safety implications. At the same time, we learned from our case studies that the workers actually use uh, roof accessory as a backing material to prevent their construction tool or construction material from sliding down. And we included uh, those, uh, those pictures in our protocol, as you can see from the uh, slide. So interesting enough, you can say that roof accessory can present advantages and disadvantages at the same time in terms of safety. Uh, specific to chimneys, uh, you should never try to use a chimney as an anchor point unless you are absolutely sure the chimney is structurally strong or it is uh, connected to the main uh, roof structures. Also, you should never consider having uh, solar panels on top of skylight or a chimney for obvious reasons. Okay, the first uh, three uh, attributes, once again, are most related to existing roof conditions. Uh, the, the, the remaining four attributes that I'm going to present in the next four slides are mostly related to uh, system design or contractors' means and method. Uh, next attribute is panel layout. Uh, we learned from our case study the interview that the panel layout can actually significantly impact the movement of uh, the solar workers. And when it comes to panel layout, uh, there can be uh, multiple standards that you have to consider. Uh, for example, one standard that can be from International Fire Code, simply IFC, or another standard that you have to consider can be from Local Safety Code. And uh, following the IFC code is actually recommended but not required, and that is why that you, you probably see some solar panels in your neighborhood that may not meet the IFC regulation. Nevertheless, uh, we recommend to follow uh, IFC regulation to secure enough clearance around the solar panels as a clear access pathway. In general, IFC suggests to have uh, three feet of clearance around the solar panel between edge of the solar panel to the edge of the roof or to the reach line of the roof. And the schematics of the uh, IFC suggestion and regulation is summarized in the protocol, and there are 
rich detail. So if you're interested in learning more about IFC regulation or suggestion, uh, please uh, 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 go ahead and review the uh, protocol. Uh, and they are available once again from the CPW website. Okay. And the next uh, protocol, and I'm sorry, X attribute is a full protection system. According to OSHA, uh, there can be uh, multiple options that you can consider for full protection systems. And uh, protocol includes a picture for each option, and it can range from safety anchors for 4S system, guardrail system, safety net system, and so on and so forth. And uh, again, uh, for the safety anchors, we strongly recommend to install them along the ridge line of the, of the roof. And that is why it is so important to follow IFC regulation to have enough clearance for workers effectively install uh, safety anchors as they want. And also when you have a significant roof access structures on the roof, such as uh, domer or chimneys, and you should have multiple uh, anchors installed for the both sides of uh, roof accessories so that roof accessories won't be interfering with the movement of the personal forest system. Okay, and next attribute is a lifting method. This largely uh, depends on the contractor's means and method, and that must be why it is not well implemented. Uh, or not well uh, enforced. Uh, what we learned from case studies and interviews is that most solar contractors still prefer the manual lifting of solar panel by using ladders. But it goes against OSHA's recommendation and goes against the requirement of many local safety code. For example, OSHA uh, recommends that workers should never carry uh, solar panels while climbing on the ladder and also workers should have uh, at least one hand free to grab the ladder while going up and down. And when it comes to lifting method, or when it comes to use, uh, when it comes to use of the ladder, uh, local code may be even stricter than OSHA standard. For example, the safety code in uh, Washington state recommends, uh, it requires that workers should have both hands free to grab the ladder while going up and down. So based on the OSHA's recommendation and then requirement of local safety code, we we would like to recommend that the use of the manual, not I'm sorry, use of the mechanical lifting should be considered for solar installation in most residential buildings, despite the fact that most solar contractors may say that it will impact their uh, productivity or uh, project cost, basically the bottom line of, of their business. And I, I think that we're gonna have more discussion about it in the next session. Okay, the next and the last attribute is electrical system. And uh, for electrical system safety regulation, uh, pretty much uh, being closely uh, followed. That's why we learn from uh, a case study and interviews. So basically, uh, solar contractors are required to have licensed trained electricians for handling and installing any type of electric or part of the solar panels. And the contractor we talked to or interviewed, they all do that pretty, pretty well. And in addition to that, we like to recommend that uh, the distribution system for the connecting the solar panels to the outside wall panels or connecting to the inside electrical system inside the house uh, the, it should be closely and carefully designed while minimizing any type of safety risk or hazard. Specific to the operational uh, phase, uh, these days solar panels or solar system are supposed to have a rapid shutdown as required by a national fire code for improved uh, safety. So it's something uh, worth mentioning. And that said, I went through uh, seven PTD uh, attributes very quickly, one by one, for your information. Again, you can find more detailed information from our protocol or our uh, final research project, our project report that are all downloadable from CPWR website. 
And that's that. Uh, in the next session, John is going to talk about the final seminar that uh, we hosted to gain industry feedback. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, nice descriptions of the attributes there. One of the things that we uh, thought about for the research study as well was uh, after doing the case studies and developing uh, the list of attributes and uh, considerations, we, we wanted to show this to the industry and ask them, uh, are we on the right track? Uh, what would you think about this in terms of implementation? Should we make any changes? Do you have any recommendations? And so as Chris mentioned, we hosted a, a seminar at the University of Washington uh, up in Seattle and uh, invited attendees who are representatives from solar contractors, um, research team members, and also some students who are interested in the, the topic and had a wonderful discussion. We presented the topic of prevention through design and we also presented what we had found so far uh, regarding the protocol and opened it up for discussion to get their feedback and opportunities. And I'm, I'm going to take just a few minutes uh, to talk about what, what they told us. So uh, first thing that we realized, and Chris alluded to this, uh, was that there are some differences between the national standards or regulations and local regulations. And that was of concern to many of the people uh, in the seminar because it, it made it difficult first of all, in determining what they should abide by, what should they implement, and uh, which one governs. The local codes govern over the national codes, and um, however, um, some local codes are less stringent than the national codes. That's what we were told from a lot of the people in the seminar. And then um, the differences, as I said, make it difficult determining what, what they need to implement. Um, what we've done here so far is to uh, develop a protocol that refers to the national codes and standards, so it's applicable around the country. But just be aware that uh, if you are implementing the protocol, that there may be some local codes that maybe are more stringent uh, that you have to apply to as well. So take that into consideration. One other thing that we uh, identified during the discussion which came up uh, was that there are many criteria that these companies are trying to fulfill. One of them is to be safe and that's important. Other goals are to be uh, financially successful, obviously, uh, to, to work in a, an efficient and productive manner to get the jobs done uh, on time and within usually one or two days, depending on the size and the amount of work to be done. But uh, most contractors want to get, to get in and out and then go on to the next solar installation. So sometimes it was uh, recognized that w with all of these criteria that there were trade-offs that had to be made during the installations and that perhaps safety was compromised in order to make sure they got the work done on time. Um, there were conflicts that were recognized related to the available roof area versus the clearance requirement. So as a homeowner, I want to maximize my energy production from my solar panels. And so perhaps I want to put as many panels as I can on the roof. If I spread the, the panels out across the roof, as many as I can put on there, maybe I compromise the, the clearance uh, related to the edges or the ridge that Chris talked about, uh, providing and creating more room for the workers to work around means perhaps less panels that I put up on the, on the roof. And that's an impact to the, the homeowner themselves. And then uh, there, were, it, it, there were discussions about uh, perhaps some of the um, safety regulations require additional hours and labor that the contractors do not want to put into the project. So that came up in our discussions. Um, they, they did recognize that there has been some improvements in the technologies themselves, the, the panels and all the electrical equipment, and that those have improved safety on, on the job. A couple other things that we found also, uh, there are some electrical issues 
related to uh, installation of the panels. And um, it's not a significant concern of the solar contractors, but um, they have been, for the most part, addressed by the manufacturers of the panels. Um, there are parts of the system that are fully enclosed and insulated, so that is a benefit that they recognize the manufacturers have provided to them. The manufacturers have designed out those hazards that, to help with the safety during installation. It's important to realize also that the electrical work must be carried out by a licensed electrician, and that can reduce some of the hazards that are present. One of the things also that um, we asked them about, uh, a question regarding if you were going to design a new house for uh, installation of solar panels, what would you want the design of the new house to look like or the new roof? What would be something that you would request the architect to design in terms of the roof slope or the size or the layout of the roof? And these are some of the suggestions that they came up with. And you can see there, as Chris mentioned before, there are certain types of roof materials that uh, are better than others. So no shake roofs or no tile roofs. The composition shingles uh, perform the best in terms of being able to uh, prevent slipping off of the roof. Uh, nothing extruding from the roof, primarily on the south side of the house where the panels are located. Uh, make it pre-wired for the panels. Um, provide anchors if uh, you need to on a steep roof, and making the roof at least four feet more between the top and bottom and six feet more on each side to provide some space for the panels to uh, be located. Incidentally, there are cities across the country, like the city of Seattle, that requires uh, new houses and commercial buildings uh, to be solar ready, meaning they have to abide by uh, some requirements to allow solar panels to be put on, put on them uh, right away after they're constructed. Lastly, I wanted to just conclude by saying we, we envision the, the process of prevention through design to incorporate, obviously, the seven attributes in the protocol that would then affect the design and the drawings that are created. And eventually, though, we we expect that the hazards to be reduced or eliminated and leading to better safety, but that's not the end of the process. We're gonna install the panels and then we're gonna realize perhaps there's some more risks that we need to address and therefore we're gonna perhaps cycle back and look at the protocol, change the designs again, implement and so forth. So continuous improvement is a goal here and that's what we're aimed at. So uh, with that, uh, Chris and I thank you for your participation, your interest, and uh, appreciate, again, the support from CPWR. And I think we've left some time here for some questions, if you have any. Yeah, thanks, John and Chris. Um, that was a wonderfully thorough uh, presentation. But if anyone has any follow-up questions, um, you can feel free to enter them in the chat uh, or Q&A box now and we have some time to answer those. Um, and again, I will be sending out a recording of today's event and a PDF of the PowerPoint slides either tomorrow or Friday. Um, so you'll have that to review. And you can always um, follow up and email me or either of our presenters directly if you have any questions that you think of later.